Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second session in our master series about dual credit in Kentucky. My name is Robin Abair, and I'll be the host and moderator for today's session, which is all about dual credit coursework in career and technical education. Today, we're going to be joined by an amazing team of CTE pros, including Leslie Slaughter, who works here at the Council in Career Pathways and K-12 Alignment. We're also joined by Amanda Jerome from Davis County Schools and Dr. Meredith Skaggs of the Owensboro CTC. They're joining us to talk about Empower You and their 20-year, yes, you heard that right, 20-year partnership that has blossomed between Davis County Schools and the Owensboro Community and Technical College. At the end of the session, Trinity will be back for our Kentucky Data Moment and today's challenge. Now, to make sure that we're helping you as best we can today, uh, we do have an active Q&A box. Feel free to drop questions and experiences about CTE there. We probably won't be able to answer your questions during this quick 30-minute session, but we will post a Q&A document along with this recording uh, after, after we wrap up today. So all the resources that are mentioned in the recording will be on CPE's website. Let's dive into dual credit and CTE. I know that our guest today will train you like a pro to bring out the very best possible CTE experiences and partnerships to your students. My CPE colleague, Leslie Slaughter, began her career as a CTE teacher, and she's worked in the field for many years. So this week, I interviewed Leslie about career pathways, dual credit, and all things CTE. So let's listen to a quick conversation um, that I had with her earlier this week. So we've been already talking a little bit about dual credit in regular education, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about dual credit in the CTE world. Sure. So in Kentucky, we have over 135 state-approved career pathways at the secondary level, and those are outlined in a program of study published by the Kentucky Department of Education every year. And so it's within those pathways that students are really preparing for the Commonwealth's most in-demand wage career opportunities, really exciting opportunities. So that program of study outlines the course sequences or progressions um, that we suggest students concentrate in to best prepare for um, fundamentally the knowledge, the skills, and the competencies that, that are going to seamlessly transition into a continued uh, training and education program at the post-secondary level um, to, to best prepare for those careers. So it's um, it's really exciting to see dual credit opportunities in CTE pathways because those courses are the courses that are oftentimes required for post-secondary credential or degree completion. So it's really an acceleration opportunity in many ways. It's a, it's a way for them to think about um, and complete coursework that will be required of them um, on that post-secondary side. Um, they're highly transferable to other related career fields. So, you know, uh, sometimes our students also know the the workforce sector they're interested in, but not necessarily the specific occupation. And so because of the nature of those career pathways really being foundational and fundamental, um, though those dual credit courses are still transferable in a lot of cases to other related post-secondary degree opportunities. So I think there's a lot of benefit for sure. Right. Wow, Leslie, 135 pathways? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of opportunity for students and a lot of connection to the workforce. Sure is. Fantastic. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about things like credentialing of teachers, the student experience, and even the difference between what it means when you attend uh, um, career technical courses at an area technology center mm -hmm. versus a, a, a career technical college. Sure. So um, we do have in Kentucky a state-operated system of area technology centers. We refer to those as ATCs. Um, those are governed by the Kentucky Department of Education, specifically the Office of Career Technical Education. So they are a state-operated system of centers that's really designed to geographically provide as much access to high-demand CTE coursework as possible, especially in our rural areas of the state. So we have 50 of those centers across Kentucky. Um, and then we also have CTE programming in our comprehensive high schools as well as locally operated um, career and technical centers that are governed by our school districts. So there's a, a, a variety of ways that coursework can be offered. Um, in the state-operated system, um, there are agreements at a state level with the KCTCS system as well as a number of other four-year institutions. So it really depends on the pathways that are offered within those regional ATCs as far as what those opportunities look like for students. 
And a lot of times we have students who engage in coursework in both settings. They may be in a pathway uh, in their local high school or local center, as well as be taking coursework at an ATC that they don't have access to in their local settings. So uh, again, it's not really an either or as much as it's maybe an, an and or both um, in some cases for students. But um, I think the difference in dual credit, again, is that those agreements for the ATCs are kind of governed in a statewide policy, um, as opposed to districts being able to have more flexibility and autonomy to create those dual credit agreements with the institutions themselves. Okay, so I'm hearing you say there's a lot of flexibility at the local level, yeah. and um, also a lot of variability, like from area to area That's across right. the state in terms of what, what might be offered or what, what might be available. That's correct, yes. Okay. okay, well, funding is always important in these conversations. So can you talk a little bit about the funding for uh, CTE dual credit? Sure, so in terms of tuition or even dual credit scholarships, those are very much the same as the general education dual credit opportunity. So where we see some slight differences at times is when you have a course that may require an additional lab component or may have other fee structures associated with it. Um, so that's where you might see some variability from time to time. So there's a huge benefit with Kentucky's dual credit scholarship program in that CT students can actually take advantage of up to eight dual credit scholarships over the course of their high school career. So that is a, a huge benefit in terms of acceleration, um, a shortened time to degree completion or accelerated entry into the workforce after high school if they're able to complete a post-secondary credential or even an associate's degree before they graduate high school, which we see happening in many pockets of the state. So uh, I think there is a lot of financial assistance available for, for students who want to pursue these dual credit opportunities. I'll also mention the Work Ready Scholarship Program, which is a seamless opportunity that many of these CTE students can um, transition into. So for those that don't know, our Kentucky Work Ready Scholarship Program provides free college for any individual in one of our state's uh, top five industry sectors for an associate's degree. So again, if students are starting an accelerated path in high school through these dual credit opportunities, um, they can complete that associate's degree in a much shorter amount of time and completely for free through the utilization of that Work Ready Scholarship Program. So that's a great benefit. And lastly, I'll mention that through the partnerships that get created through the CTE programs of study with business and industry. Oftentimes in regional communities there are employer champions that are even willing to help pay for additional dual credit coursework beyond the scholarship opportunities um, and even pay for you know um, the extended completion of those degree opportunities. So I think in uh, the world of career technical education there's a lot of financial assistance opportunity. Yeah, yeah it sounds like students have a great opportunity to get the on-ramp while they're in high school. Right and then transition into post-secondary with the Work Ready Scholarship and with a lot of connections in business and industry that they've been able to establish because of those experiences they've had. Absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful. I think I'm hearing you say that it's really important for the, the high school and the post-secondary partner to ensure that students are making the most of every course opportunity Absolutely. they have. Absolutely. Yes, I think the theme over the last several years has been make every credit count. And so we really have to have intentionality um, in working with our partners to plan that seamless progression of, of coursework so that students are not duplicating um, but accelerating into these career fields. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thank you again, Leslie, for being our expert today. We'll make sure that all of the resources that you mentioned are available to everyone who's joining us today. They'll, they'll be able to take advantage of it. Thank you again. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right, so grateful for Leslie's input there on CTE, and we will definitely share Leslie's contact information at the end of our session if you would like to follow up with her about any, uh, any of what she talked about. At this time, I'd like to welcome Amanda Jerome into the conversation. Amanda is with Davis County Schools, and uh, welcome, Amanda. We thank you for joining us today. Um, I'd love to hear a little about yourself and the role that you have there in Davis County. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate you having myself and Dr. Skaggs today on the webinar. Um, so I am the College and Career Readiness Coordinator for Davis County Public Schools and oversee what we call Empower You, which are academy programs uh, that offer dual credit, and many of those are CTE based. Yeah, I know that uh, you're really proud of Davis County's Empower You. 
So uh, I'd love for you to just really tell us more about it and feel free, feel free to back, brag a little bit about what's going on. And okay. uh, you can just let me know whenever you're ready to uh, share. Yeah. Any of those slides. If, you, if you don't mind to share those slides, that would be okay. great. So, and I'll just talk a little bit. Um, so Empower You kind of came into existence, uh, really the term Empower You kind of came into existence right before COVID. Um, previously, we were in a model called Community Campus, which allowed high school students from our area high schools to participate in dual credit uh, options. Uh, and then our program growed uh, so quickly, uh, grew so quickly that we uh, decided to kind of make an umbrella call and empower you because we want to empower students on their career choices and getting them ready for college and career opportunities uh, after high school. So as you can see there on the slide, I'm very proud of my students and former students. Every student that's pictured in these slides uh, that you'll see today are former um, dual credit students in some capacity. So you can go ahead to the next slide if you don't mind. Uh, we've had substantial growth in dual credit. Um, uh, we have seen more than 241% increase in course enrollment since the fall of 2016 and more than 125% increase in student participation overall. Um, but we do maintain an average pass rate amongst all of our students of 97%. So we're very proud of that. Uh, the high expectations for the students, as well as our college and career coach at Apollo High School, who's my partner, uh, Kelly Spa. She's very instrumental in all of this happening as well. Um, so we have grown to, we have just over 1,200 students, and we actually are probably creeping closer to the 1,300 uh, student number, uh, even this semester here in the spring of 2023. Um, so as I said, we are really proud of our pass percentage because I think that you can have a lot of students participate, but if the students aren't doing well, then, you know, I, I, I doubt the service that maybe we're providing to the students because we want them to be successful in their classes. Um, and so last fall, this past fall, uh, ending in December, we were at 98.1. So I was really, really pleased with that. We have an Ag Academy, which obviously is CTE based, very hands on. Our students are able to enroll in principles of agriculture as eighth graders in our three middle schools. Uh, and then they transition to either Apollo High School or Davis County High um, to continue in that FFA and Ag environment and uh, those classes. We have our Engineering Academy, which is our oldest academy that we have. Um, very proud of it. We live in some great new spaces at Apollo High School. Uh, we have some beautiful new labs that uh, our teachers and our students get to work in and thrive in. So just very proud of that. Um, I'm fortunate to have three engineering teachers through uh, Project Lead the Way, uh, Mr. Uh, Lair, Mr. May, and Mr. Winslow. Uh, all three are excellent. We're currently taking applications to enroll in this program. It's very rigorous. Um, students apply as they enter their freshman year and have the opportunity to earn 22 hours of free college credit um, and very hands-on as you can see from those pictures. Um, another one of our older academies, our long-standing academies is our Life Science Academy. Uh, it's the study of biomedical science. We have about 130 students consistently enrolled in that academy, grades nine through 12. Um, they are also able to earn 16 hours of free college credit. Um, and that actually takes place on the campus. So we have such an awesome relationship with our partners at OCTC. I can't say that enough. Um, and, you know, none of this would be possible without them. So we're just so appreciative to get to reside there on campus. And I think that's very meaningful for the students to leave their high school for one block a day and actually go to the campus. And it makes them feel very grown up and adult. And I think that it also adds to the serious nature of the classes and they understand like I'm taking a college class. This is important. Um, then we have our Early College Academy. We have over 200 students enrolled in that right now. Um, students are earning their associate's degrees either in arts or science. Um, and so we're busy collecting applications for that program as well right now. And then we're also collecting applications in our high schools for students who may just wanna pick up a couple of classes or they may wanna explore a technical program. 
uh, over at, at the community college. So um, we're collecting those applications. We're always great, I think, about advertising the um, free classes that students can take through the Kentucky Dual Credit Scholarship. We always try to maximize on those dollars for all of our students. Um, and then we always uh, try our hardest to um, get as many students eligible for the Work Ready Scholarship as well. So that's how we get those engineering classes paid for, the Life Science Academy, of course, the technical classes, and a variety of other classes. All right, Amanda, thank you for that overview of kind of some of the programs that are offered. Um, I'd like to hear just a little bit more before we invite Mer uh, Meredith into the room. I'd like to hear just a little bit more about some of the students that you serve within the CTE academies and how they land in this program. Yeah, so um, we start recruiting and talking to students as early as middle school um, and do some heavy recruiting in eighth grade because we do have so many opportunities in Davis County Public Schools uh, that I want to make sure that parents and students are aware of those opportunities. So we really target the eighth graders, we talk to them about the opportunities because even if they're not going to enroll in engineering or life science academy as a freshman, I think it's important for parents to know what's coming down the road. And uh, of course, you know, our high schools are busy scheduling right now for fall, um, and we'll do that most of the month in March until spring break. And I just like to talk to the parents about even if your student's not jumping in right now. There are plenty of options, especially your junior and senior year, for you to get involved and for you to explore that career that you think that you're interested in or get prepared for a four-year college. Um, so really pleased by that. I have so many great students. I mean, um, I think that they know that myself and Kelly really care about them and really care about what their career goes are. Uh, and we host a lot of parent nights um, to get the word out because I want folks to know the information, but I also want them to come into a program and, and have everything that they need to make a good educated decision about what they're doing and what they're enrolling in. Yeah, I really appreciate all the all the many times that you mentioned just the student, keeping the student at the center and what their career goals are and making sure they're on the right track for that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Amanda. Um, we're about out of time for this part of the conversation. So let's invite uh, Meredith now into the into the room. Dr. Meredith Skaggs from OCTC. Welcome. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit now from the, um, the community and technical college side of things. Tell us a little bit more about maybe some of the opportunities and pathways and programs that students have access to, um, and especially how uh, they have co really career experiences um, in, their, in their work there with you. Sure. Uh, and so my role at OCTC, uh, my primary Responsibility as department head of the humanities and fine arts, but I also serve as our <laughs> you wear a lot of hats. <laughs> yeah, we have lots of hats. I don't even really wear hats in real life, <laughs> but I to wear them metaphorically. Is that we have a our NACEP accreditation, so a National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Program. So I coordinate the academic affairs component of that and work mostly with the faculty credentialing and course rigor and in that area of the conversation. Um, at OCTC, we have a robust concurrent enrollment partnership uh, with all of our service regions, but uh, specifically with Davis County Public Schools. I want to say also, I know Amanda uh, mentioned Kelly. Kelly is actually on the call. So, hey, Kelly. <laughs> and uh, we have a great working relationship with them. Uh, it allows us to offer a diverse range of concurrent enrollment opportunities. And so students specifically in those opportunities, they get the concurrent enrollment credit, like with the Engineering Academy or Life Science Academy. But we're also able to provide accessible college education experiences within the high school with certified regional accreditedly certified faculty. That's how I got started in the college experience. It helped give me a lot of confidence in myself academically and then transitioned into what is now known as early college. So it does provide students with that opportunity to sort of taste and see and experience that. And we do that really well. Uh, OCTC is also part of an experiential learning uh, opportunity title three grants. So that has helped us to uh, align students with career shadowing, with um, hands-on opportunities or panels, anything that we can think of to help connect employers to the students. 
We're also part of the CPE's Graduate Profile Academy of embedding the 10 essential workplace skills into our curriculum, regardless of where the class is taught. And so there are a lot of touch points for those career skills. We also invite the technical students into our campus for their technical education classes as dual credit. They're welcome into any of our technical programs that are not selective admissions. And we work with the high schools in terms of scheduling. We try to align some of our fundamental classes for the technical program to fit the block schedule of our high school partners, just to logistically help allow students to do that. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's a general overview summary. We have uh, other programs, work and learn programs that are very well known across the state, such as Go Fame, which is our, um, our version of the manufacturing work and learn program. We have snowballed that into pretty much go whatever you want to be. We have a go careers program for the business track. Uh, and I know Antoine, I saw Antoine's name on the call. We used to work together on those programs. And so um, we do have a lot of advisory councils for all of our technical programs and all of them are aware of our dual credit programming. And I also sit on advisory councils for our area technology centers in some of those programs to help update curriculum or just always maintain that ultimate flow of communication. But that, that's the sum of it, I guess. Yeah. You know, Meredith, uh, you mentioned early on about teacher credentialing and and you uh, you said something earlier just in our conversation about the um, respectful relationship you have between OCTC and Davis sure. County and the faculty that yeah. um, participate with you. So can you talk just a little bit more about that? And then I would you come on back into to. the room. It's too. really my favorite part of the conversation. So um, we have uh, a wonderful working relationship, uh, Discover College, which is the umbrella program for us. That's what we refer to it at, on our campus. And that covers our partnership with all of our high school areas. Um, but when going to, even at state meetings or at national conferences, Amanda and I have always, uh, we kind of look at each other at these sessions where people start to fuss about the dynamics that they have with their between their post-secondary and secondary partners. And I'm extremely thankful that that is not the case with um, any of our high school partners. We have a lot of respect for the faculty at the high school level and their ability to provide a rigorous education, to care deeply for student success, and to understand the implications of a student to participating in that class in the long-term conversation of what that looks like. The ability to build that relationship with our high school partners is our success for me. When I look at like, what is the secret sauce to, that was the, if you were at the success summit, you heard a lot about secret sauce, <laughs> that we had the secret sauce for that partnership comes from understanding the value of that credential and then trusting that credential and trusting in that experience. Yes, we still do site visits because our NACEP accreditation expects it. Yes, we still gather assessments and compare them. Yes, we still gather syllabi and compare those and submit that for our NACEP accreditation. However, that is, uh, we frame that and I encourage anyone who has partnerships with your secondary partners that is not framed as oversight, that is framed as a conversation piece. Those are conversation pieces to talk colleague to colleague about the value of the class, talk about what the students need, talk about what your school needs, and use that as a shared language in order to talk and move your program forward. Site visits are a wonderful way to build relationships. It allows uh, our campus to get connected with our secondary partners. If you want to look at it from a numbers perspective, it's a wonderful recruitment opportunity, especially for program coordinators in a technical program to, for a student at, on a secondary campus. So in the engineering track, they could go into Mr. Lear's classroom, say hello, explain how those credits transfer into the technical degree program. And then that's the same face that that student sees when they walk into their first day of class. That's the empowering part of it. And so the more that we can, I'm getting, I need to calm down. The more <laughs> that we get uh, on board with the idea that we are same team, period. Even if it's very hard to feel that way because of being in different buildings or having a lot of different puzzle pieces that play into what we can do. And it can be frustrating sometimes to navigate the different expectations of all of the competing agencies. Students are at the center of that. We all agree to that one train of thought. Our faculty 
I do not differentiate our secondary and post-secondary faculty. They are our faculty and they do excellent work, period. Um, there are pe people who go through seasons of struggle on either campus. And that's just, that's another conversation point. It's fine. That's, that's right. And, you know, it's good people. to acknowledge that that, that is just kind of the, kind of how it is. I, I really appreciated you bringing students back in there at the end of the conversation. So we're just about out of time, but I would love to hear just a quick story from each of you, a quick success story for uh, a student. I made to go first. Okay. Um, so I have so many, but um, one very recent uh, story, we had a girl, a student at Apollo High School. She actually enrolled in our Life Science Academy as a freshman, um, really loved it, decided she wanted to do early college. Um, so went into early college as a junior, uh, ended up loving that so much. She was able to graduate with double associate's degrees. Um, so she really had her sights set on working in law enforcement. And so went to Eastern Kentucky University as a student there. Um, graduated at 20 years old, I believe, with double bachelor's degrees. Um, and has recently been accepted to a very prestigious program at Stevenson University in Maryland for crime scene investigation in their master's program. So, and she made the sweetest Facebook post about, you know, how life-changing and how um, just incredible the opportunities were. And of course I cried like a baby, but um, <laughs> that's who I am. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's just one of so many, so many, so many stories of students' lives that we've changed. And that's why I do what I do because I really do believe in our motto in our district is kids first. And that's how I operate. Um, under all circumstances, I'm gonna put these kids first. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Amanda. All right, Meredith, you're up. All right. So uh, I'll categorize these in the students who came to this college experience saying that they were not learners and that they were not students, that they were, um, I work with my hands, Ms. Skaggs. I don't learn, like I don't do the book. Like they were very adverse to anything outside of a technical lab. I had the opportunity to uh, meet a student who graduated from DCPS and he had a horrible high school GPA. He came into one of our work and learn programs and ended up graduating almost at the top of the work and learn class. And he's been graduated um, for about eight years. Two months before he graduated, he was offered a contract. Uh, and this again, eight years ago, it was over $25 an hour, which was, I mean, it's good now. It was great then. And he was just beaming. And he literally linked arms with me and walked down the hallway to tell me about his, like how happy he was with that. Uh, now he is a full shift supervisor. He isn't responsible for people's safety and for the production of millions of dollars worth of things that make our world go around. Uh, another student in that cohort is finishing his engineering degree and they are students who looked me in the eye and said, I hate this. Like I hate school. I do not, I am not a learner. And yet they have uh, continued to learn and mentor back and lead. And it was a beautiful reminder of what Amanda said. We get, we have the privilege of uh, spe spe specifically in the community college environment of serving a sort of a tender and very resilient population. And it is a privilege to do so. And they make our communities what they are. And so I think to you, to anyone who is helping lead that. I know we have um, Derek Strode from WKU Owensboro on here as well right now with our four-year partners here in Owensboro. And so there's just, we do great work and it is a privilege. And I think we can lose sight of that in the day-to-day. -day. And uh, so I hope if you're kind of feeling a little run down, it is almost spring break for us. I know our K-12 partners have a little bit longer to go that you can be reminded of the privilege it is of what we get to do. Yeah. yeah, well, we are celebrating Empower You and this great partnership between Davis County and Owensboro CTC today and just so appreciate you all coming on and, and sharing your personal stories and your heart for students and uh, the work in career and te technical education. All right, we're winding down our 30 minutes. I'm a little bit behind, but we're going to invite uh, Trinity Walsh now into the room to uh, take us home with our uh, with our data challenge. Thanks, Robin. Amanda and Meredith's partnership is just one example of the many practices across the state who are building an amazing CTE dual credit program and engaging students in building capacity. And now I challenge you to enhance your CTE dual credit programming with this webinar's data challenge. 
We know from the research about 34% of learners are taking courses for post-secondary credit. In Kentucky, we're proud to be ahead of the national percentage at approximately 40% of high school students taking a dual credit course at some point during their high school career. Approximately a third of high school students are taking CTE courses for dual credit, and Kentucky sitting right about 30% of our students taking CTE dual credit courses. CTE dual credit programming lends itself to the national norm of students who participate in early post-secondary opportunities being more prepared for college and career. States who encourage students to participate in CTE early post-secondary opportunities have a wide range of credentialing opportunities that can help expand their future paths. Dual credit enrollment in Kentucky continues to rise each year. As you can see, there is a small data blip in 2021, but that's to be expected with COVID. When isolated, CTE dual credit is following the same trend of upward mobility and actually saw the largest yearly growth within dual credit programming this past year. Advanced CTE has a wide variety of information and resources that can help with accessibility and access for your entire student population. That being said, during the last webinar, we discussed creating a dual credit team. So using the same team, or maybe even creating a team dedicated to just CTE dual credit, Advanced CTE provides tools and materials that will help you analyze your CTE programming. To understand how this goal setting tool works, we're going to take a few minutes to watch the introductory video. This explainer video shares more about the Achieving Inclusive CTE project and the Achieving Inclusive CTE goal setting tool. The Achieving Inclusive goal setting tool is designed to help users assess and improve representativeness of learner groups across three categories of indicators, access to CTE, success within CTE programs, programs and CTE post-program outcomes across a state or local CTE or career pathway system. Leaders can leverage this goal setting tool in program review, approval or reapproval, program monitoring, civil rights monitoring, equity audits, equity gap analyses, and examination of equity and disaggregated student performance data as part of Perkins 5 Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment. This goal setting tool helps learners because it considers the full universe of learners who could engage in career pathways and CTE programs of study. With this goal setting tool, leaders can more intentionally plan to recruit, engage, and support underrepresented learner groups to increase access to high quality CTE programs and career pathways. The Achieving Inclusive CTE project includes two components, a goal setting tool and a companion manual. The Achieving Inclusive CTE goal setting tool is a downloadable Excel workbook template. It guides users through entering data and setting goals. It then shows users how many more learners in each group would need to be engaged or supported to meet those goals. The companion manual guides users through Excel workbook, including tips and screenshots. It describes indicator definitions to make them customizable for your state or local context. It clarifies the data that should be populated within the workbook, includes guiding questions and reflections for setting goals, and includes a fillable action plan workbook to guide users on leveraging the analyses and moving towards reaching those goals. We will be announcing additional learning application opportunities in the coming months to support the use of this tool. For more information or questions you have in the meantime, please contact Haley Wing at hwing at careertech.org. This explainer video shared I would encourage you also, in addition to those resources, to read the State of CTE Early Post-Secondary Opportunities Report, released in March of 2022. It shares key findings in equitable access, learner supports, data collection, credit transferability, and addressing barriers. So between the advanced CTE goal setting tool and this report, it should give you a good start on analyzing and strengthening your CTE dual credit programming. Both of these resources will be on the CPE dual credit webpage after the webinar. Additionally, I want to mention that the Kentucky Council on Post-Secondary Education, CPE, is pleased to announce its involvement in a new national initiative known as LAUNCH, Equitable and Accelerated Pathways for All. The program aims to expand access to higher, high quality and equitable college and career pathways for all learners. 
To find out more about this initiative, please join us for critical conversations with elected officials and state and local leaders participating in launch around how to design, scale, and sustain high quality and equitable college and career pathways that are built to last. This registration link is on the screen and will be in the webinar resources on the CPE dual credit webpage. All right, well, thank you so much, Trinity, for that uh, look at data uh, in the CTE world. What a great session. I wanna say thanks again to Leslie Slaughter and Amanda Jerome and Dr. Meredith Skaggs for being our expert guests and to Trinity for challenging us with more, uh, with more data. Um, next up, we have creating strong partnerships uh, between high schools and colleges, and you will enjoy a panel discussion, and that will be a new format for us. We will include James Katchen from Thomas More, Heather Davis from EKU, Emily Thurman from Maysville, CTC, and our own Mitzi Holland, who's the Executive Director of CPE's Kentucky Advising Academy. Our expert guests will uh, <clears throat> discuss these great partnerships, what they include, and how you can build them for student success. You don't want to miss it. Also, don't forget that we're looking for partners who might be interested in a dual credit community of practice beginning this spring. We're grateful for the response that we've already had, as about 20 of you across the state have already filled out this form. If you'd like more details about the community of practice, just scan the QR code that you see there and complete the Google form. There is no obligation for you. Uh, we'll just be in touch about details as we launch the uh, community of practice. <clears throat> Finally, please stay connected with us and our expert guests on social media. Uh, you can find everyone's contact information there on the screen. Now, before you leave, be sure to drop those final questions or ideas into the chat box, and we'll address those in the Q&A coming soon. Until next time, friends, happy Thursday.